Going to do something a little different here. I'm going to save everybody on this side of the room some neck kinking because I've been looking over that way. I'm sitting over here for the whole morning. So I'm going to be talking over here to wake you guys up. Okay. I'm here talking about mineral oils, mineral oil hydrocarbons, and all the fun related to finding them in your food. So we're going to talk about what are they, where are they in food packaging, talk about some GC analysis, and then GCFID versus MS detection. So what are they? In case you didn't know, mineral oil hydrocarbons are a class of chemical compounds derived from petroleum. Got that? Now comes the fun part. Two different subtypes. MOSH, M-O-S-H, mineral oil saturated hydrocarbon. MOA, mineral oil aromatic hydrocarbon. Distinct difference between these two. We'll get to that in a second. So MOSH, saturated hydrocarbons, paraffins, naphthenes, Lots of different isomers, lots of different combinations, lots of different chain lengths. We just showed one example here, otherwise it would have been an eye chart. Mineral oil aromatic hydrocarbon, so MOA. It's a mixture of, whoops, there we go, um, aromatic rings, mono dye, highly alkylated, made from different distillation fractions. Uh, just to let you know, disclaimer, this is about four different talks put together, so the flow is not as slick as some uh, previous presentations. Okay, so mineral oil hydrocarbons, MOSH, the saturated, is about 75%, give or take 5 or 10%, MOA, around 25%. Technical grade uh, contains, you know, 10 to 35% MOA. Food grade, white oils, highly purified. The content is minimized for MOA. So, great, now we know about those things, but let me throw in a little something to see if you're awake after lunch. POSH, polyolefin saturated hydrocarbon, chemically identical to MOSH, even rhymes with MOSH. Possible to misidentify POSH as MOSH. It's almost like you need a scorecard to keep track of the players. Okay, where do we get this stuff? Now that I've thoroughly confused you with MOSH, MOA, POSH, you find mineral oil hydrocarbons from recycled paper and carton board. A lot of it comes from the inks, the offset inks. Offset inks used with mineral oil. And my colleague Greg Pache could probably expand on that, but in the interest of time, we're going to move along. Adhesives from waxes. They definitely have a bit of mineral oil content about them. Metal cans, processing aids, lubricants. Virgin cardboard will have some, but it's typically from food grade waxes coatings. And then of course, jute sisal sacks. They're used in the spinning of the sisal fibers. You're talking, um, these things are for cocoa beans and coffee beans. You don't really find jute sacks as a finished product packaging unless you're getting into something boutique-y or artsy. Um, typically, recycled paper and carton board or the sisal jute sacks is where you're going to find the biggest problems. So, is there a concern? We've got a few toxicologists here. Might be able to answer this better than me. For MOSH, there's a lack of evidence of a concern. Nestle's a European company, they're based in Switzerland. When you say there's lack of evidence for a concern, that doesn't mean there's zero concern. So you have to dig and find a problem. That's the European way. MOA. <laughs> MOA, there is carcinogenic potential. And by golly, we're looking into that to make sure there is a real potential instead of just a thought about it. NGOs have taken up the cause. Hey, MOA might be carcinogenic. Prop 65, anybody? Polystyrene, styrene, potential carcinogen? Do we see any parallels here? So not only have the NGOs taken up the cause, they've published reports. 
in the trade journals. And guess what? There are food products listed. The last thing a brand owner wants is his product up there with a little red frowny face. Green, okay, that's not so bad. However, it's still in kind of a negative article. And of course, when the NGOs do something, the governments have to follow suit to make it look like they're doing something. The Germans, they have a draft regulation for mineral oils with very, very low MOSH and MOA migration limits into the food, which is creating an enormous headache for Nestle in Europe. We're not in Germany, who cares? Yeah, but a lot of intermarket supply is a problem especially for multinational companies. Huge problem. So let's talk about analytical methods. Kind of a rough outline, samples are extracted, cleaned with SPE, and this gives an initial separation into MOSH and MOA parts. So you will see two chromatograms, next couple slides. These are the different fractions out of the SPE. Gas chromatograms need to separate the peaks and identify them FID, and of course, mass spec is another possible detection method. So let's talk about, uh oh, there we go. All right, MOSH and MOA, typically five to one, four to one ratio. In the chromatograms, there are humps that are an indication of mineral oil. Uh, MS is needed to confirm the presence of the humps especially for MOA, and DIPN is a compound from recycled board. It's really useful, it's a marker compound to say, oh, this mineral oil came most likely from recycled board as opposed to saying it's from jute sack. And this is important when you're trying to trace where it's coming from. We have, a, we have virgin cardboard, but we've got or we've got virgin carton board, and, but we still have mineral oils. Do you see DIPN or not? We'll tell you whether it came from maybe the shipping container or maybe the jute sack. If you don't have it, it's probably the jute sack. Need a GCMS to identify DIPN. Uh, MOH from jute sacks or waxes have no DIPN. Okay, here's a chromatogram. You have the MOSH fraction here. You have the MOA fraction. And they're typically reported in C16 to C24, and then C25 to C34. You typically don't see much above C35. If you were talking about contamination in the C16 to C24, this can be done in the gaseous phase. You do not need intimate contact with the product. If you're talking C25 to C34, that's when you're talking about rubbing up and getting personal with the ingredient or the food itself. So here you have contaminated chocolate mosh fraction. See this nice little hump here? Remember that hump. When you go into the uh, iron uh, extract, you will also see the humps, which is a key indication that you're not dealing with something non-mineral oil. This is the MOA fraction of the same contaminant. Once again, you have these nice little humps. Again, you do see some humping here. It's a way to confirm when you see MOA and MOSH, you're assured you have mineral oil. When you have something like this, as just chocolate, you have a field of peaks, and you say, well, you know, that's kind of a hump. What's it look like when we extract the ions? Well, the black is the TIC, the hump goes away. See who's there? It's possibly posh, certainly not mineral oil. Um, okay, look at, the, look at the MOA. Once again, we have something that, you know, could be a hump, um, but it looks pretty flat when you do the extract. So when you have no repeatable humps, you don't have any MOA. Now let's stir up the pot a little bit. EFSA in 2012 said, hey, GCFID method works. 
And like all good friends and colleagues in the different regulatory areas, Germany, Switzerland, several EU commercial labs all grabbed the FID, said, hey, great, let's go. So now you've got all these people running around with FID saying, here you have it. However, you will get false positives for mineral oil. And the NGOs will say, you have mineral oils. And you grab the sample, and you run it on a MS detector, and you say, no, we don't. You really need very experienced analysts if you're using FID. And even then, it's not a true confirmation. The other interesting thing is GCMS with ion extraction, you have a lower LOD versus the FID. So there were some collaborative tests done over in Europe. Um, and they found, OK, using FID, you can find MOSH, you can find MOA in the various fractions. Something that's, you know, a lower cut, doesn't have any of the higher stuff detected. Great. Let's do some recycled board. Or board. Maybe they didn't tell them it was not recycled. And you have, okay, some moderate amounts of mineral oils. But one of these is actually virgin, and you don't have any MOA when you check with the GCMS. Oh, bummer. So this might be from some sort of waxes. And then you have some sort of cereals, breakfast cereals. You say, okay, well, we've got very little here, and we confirm we have none. Um, here's a little bit, but GCMS says we don't really have any. Um, as, as it goes along, you need the GCMS to say, actually, guys, I don't think we have any. So if you compile some data, you put it in graph form, you say, okay, this gray, I'm glad the colors are kind of coming through, is what FID says we have. These orangey colored ones are the actual ones that MS has confirmed. You say, look at all, look at this. Look at all of those that they say, oh, we have mineral oils, but we really don't by MS. Most of these are nothing. And, um, this is the limit proposed by the German authorities, and you've got approximately one milligram per kilogram noise level, yet people are reporting even these levels. So now let's go to MOA. It gets even stickier. Here's your noise limit, and you've got people reporting levels, but down here, this is the limit proposed by the Germans. It's actually in the noise. FID looks clean. Why not? Because of all the false positives here. That's why not. You've got these one, two, three, four, five out of the set of 27 that are actually MOA. I hope I'm on time. False positives for MOSH fraction can be from POSH or food grade MOA or excuse me, mineral oil, as in no MOA. So when you only find posh or mosh with no MOA, it's, it's food grade. Everybody catching all those known <laughs> summaries? OK. False positive for MOA, the, the aromatic, can be from ink varnish. There's some aromatic compounds used in the outer clear coating layer. I won't name names, but they kind of look like styrene. Um, and, of course, rosins from paperboard can also give a false positive for the aromatic uh, <laughs> mineral oil. Nestle Laboratories have used only GCMS. There is a publication that's been submitted to make a case for MOA with MS detection, but it's swimming upstream. You've got the Swiss authorities, you've got the German authorities, and several commercial laboratories, all saying FID works great. And as has been talked about before, there's no official method for these. It'd be great if AOAC decided, out of the goodness of its heart, it really wanted to clear up this matter before it comes to the US. And suddenly, the NGOs are beating the drums, and we have BPA all over again, except for false positives instead of it's really bad for you. So, in conclusion, special thanks to the analytical 
team at Nestle Research Center in Lausanne, Switzerland, especially Mr. Jesus Varela, who did most of these chromatograms. And source material for the presentation was from Mr. Lionel Spack, Nestle Quality Assurance Center in Orb, and Petra Schmanke from Nestle Germany. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm open for any questions. How are you doing on time? Is this just an issue in the EU or in the U.S. as well? The reason that I'm asking is that in the U.S. you can buy mineral oils at basically any pharmacy. It's considered a safe laxative. It's used in almost any candy shop because it gives a glaze to the candy. Also, it, maybe it's banned in the EU, but those little Swedish fish gummies are, have, have that coating of mineral oil in them. They're used on cutting boards as water resistance. They're, yeah, on and on and on. So Anybody use chapstick? You can buy that in Europe, and it's loaded with mineral oil. Yes, of course. However, they're all looking at the MOA portion and freaking out. Hmm. And so that's what's got everybody stirred up. Because what you're, all that you're describing has the MOA, the aromatic fraction, minimized or eliminated. Yeah. So yeah, you can find mineral oils all over the world. It's not hard. <laughs>